Welcome to After Hours. My name is Richter. I am your host. Richter! What? Leave him alone! This shit is real. Now we got Richter go and we're gonna have to hear it about it all night. Yeah. <laughs> that's a bunch of screaming memes out there and that's the scoop that has been reported so far. Thanks for dropping me like a snot. I'm not interested in believing in something. Either it's real or it's not. By your opinion that you are no-kill, you are dooming the species to be extinct. They are what they are. It doesn't matter what we call them. Let's remove ourselves from them a little bit. And I think that's something that the Bigfoot community can actually learn a little bit from. I actually am trying to push the envelope of science here. When are we going to make a video, Richter? And I mean not an X-rated one. Dr. Todd, you've also been called the scoff dick. <laughs> yeah, well, have these creatures stood against a backdrop of trees, I probably never would have seen them. You can't talk about that. I can. So you guys are going to bag a Bigfoot and get us a body. We're giving it uh, our best efforts. We thought that we had the holy grail of DNA. Our hero, Bob Gimlin, is with us. Hello, is this thing on? Am I muted? Can you hear me? Hey, Richter, I've got a question for you. How does it feel to lose Bigfoot Bounty? Hmm. My question is, why do you think Bigfoot is real? Richter does put a lot of effort <laughs> into his costuming, doesn't he? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, by effort, if you mean bending over and picking up whatever's on the floor. My! Well, in my opinion, After Hours with Richter is the number one Bigfoot webcast. Uh, what's your name again? Oh. Don't piss Richter off. <laughs> but the other thing is, uh, like some of the people around here that talked this weekend, you could have a situation if it's really a hominid and you shoot it, it may be a kind of hominid that would be called murder. Some people say it's more man-like. More human-like. Some people yeah. who witness them say they're more ape-like. I mean, gosh, what is it? But we're apes, so. Some people disagree. <laughs> the well, whole Christian, you know, fundamental yeah, if alliance. Yeah, you get into religious backgrounds and creationists and stuff, we're all separate and different. Right. But most people that are involved in the Bigfoot area understand that humans are apes. Are we apes, Tammy? Well, you look kind of apish. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Hi. Get you in there. Hi all right. There. All right. Dr. Melba Ketchum. Uh, doctor of veterinary science. Doctor of veterinary science believes that Sasquatch bypasses the tree of life, which is primarily accepted by all scientists to be the, the beginnings of life on this planet. She believes that si Bigfoot is an offshoot and totally bypasses and poof, there it is. What does it matter what anybody thinks if they... You look at the data. You know, you have a, a doctor, mm -hmm. Matthew Johnson, who's a doctor of clinical psychology, and he has theories. You have a doctor, Ketchum. You have a doctor, Sykes, who's chemical, biochemical genetics. They all have their certain fields. They should just present the data and let other people who have a combined field mm -hmm. really do the theorize. And one of the presentations here at Beachfoot criticized Sykes for doing excellent data, excellent article, but he had no zoological background, no background that would put that all in context. And so you have to really look at what, if you're, you're saying that uh, Bigfoot is partially from an angel and partially from a Neanderthal and partially from a human, why are you, is anyone even listening to that? It's right. not really helping the field. And you can't test angels. Right. It's all a belief. Exactly. There's no data. It's all faith uh, Dr. Disatel says, uh, show us the raw data. Where is the paper trail? Pa yeah. And you can't take someone's word for it just because they say, I did this and you have to take my word for it and I'm not going to show it because of the backlash and the scientific community um, is biased toward me and you create your own journal. Yeah. I mean, I mean, she did many things that are embarrassing. Uh, embarrassing for her now too. I mean, it's just you got to learn the rules of the game. If you want to play hardball, I mean, I always say this: you beat them at their own game. You know, you can't create, make your own rules, especially when these are the big boys. That's just my opinion. I'm not a scientist, so just. Am I wrong? No, but I, I think even 
not to criticize you, but there's so much going on in the bog beer. There's so much going on with these podcasts and these videos. How are they helping the field? How is this today helping the field? You know, is our is our critique? I'm no expert. I mean, I've written books. I've been in the field 55 years. I don't like to be called an authority. I don't like to be called an expert. We all have our own personal opinions, but is it really helping the field or is it just adding to the backbiting? Is it adding to sort of the sensationalism that those scientists that should be quietly doing research and quietly proving Bigfoot, uh, does it put more distance between them and us by having stuff like this? It's a question we have to ask. Oh, of course. It doesn't mean I think it's not worthy because I think sociologically, psychology, psychologically it's all important, but in terms of really looking at this, are we, should he, even anybody be listening to me today or listening to you or you? Well, because there's a vested interest and it's good to have different opinions. Right. I mean, you know, I've had Ron Moorhead, who believes in quantum physics, can be applied to Bigfoot and other things that are happening in South America with those elongated skulls and things like that. You know, and I've got Bob Gimlin and I have, you know, you, Lauren Coleman. So it's good to get different viewpoints and discuss the sub subject matter. Right, but what I'm saying specifically is to interview my, me or Bob about our own experiences or our own thoughts is one thing, but then to bring in other people and critique them just adds to what is already going on out there right. to the they versus us. And we're doing, it's kind of like we're eating our own children. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to do it. I wrote a, a scathing review of Sykes books that he made. He didn't even know, he put in there the Patterson-Gimlin film happened October 20th. 1968. You oh, don't write it. Off by a year. Off by a year. And there was other little mistakes like that. And it just tells me you don't have people that are so outside the field writing books without having somebody critique mm. their book for them or mm. proofread it. Attention to detail, people. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, bottom line is, is that real science is not happening on blogs and on Facebook and on Twitter. And on YouTube. Right. It is happening with people that are out in the woods and doing... And sometimes in academia. Right, yeah. uh, or like what John Bindernagel is doing and all of the effort he's putting into uh, collecting evidence and, and tracking it and documenting it as a science. Right, and one of the things that I say very often about this book, this is a history of what's happened. Right. You know, it's, it looks at the people it looks at the incidents. It doesn't really. Bender Dingle's book is very good scientifically uh, from his point of view. This is my point of view. That's why one of the chapters that's criticized so much in here is Sex and the Single Sasquatch. Because I actually am trying to push the envelope of science here. Scientists, in terms of a lot of people that are out in the field, their prudishness will have us being ignoring the breasts, the penis, and other things that's going on in terms of this animal out there possibly being a biological species. If you're looking at biological species, you talk about their parts of the body, <clears throat> but you don't go looking for them. Lauren, what's the one question no one's ever asked you in regards to crypto and Bigfoot and paranormal? I have been asked almost every question it's come into human consciousness. So I can't really remember or think about what question hasn't been answered. In fact, that question has been answered a lot. I mean, has been asked a lot. What has never been asked? Okay, <laughs> okay why do you think Bigfoot is real? Uh, I'm not sure that I think Bigfoot is real. That kind of question says, it, its assumption is that I'm a true believer. I'm still looking for answers. I'm still looking for data. Well, there you go. There you have it. Um, let's get all together. Tammy on the shot. Well, thank you, Lauren, for joining our After Hours family. Sure. You're right up there with the likes of Bob Gimlin, Matt Moneymaker, Les Stroud, Dr. Bender Nagel, Bob, and Kathy Strain. Sweet, sassy, glassy. Well, thank you for Back inviting home. me no, wait, into we... the woods with you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, we got to do it again. Okay. Oh. okay, sweet, sassy, glassy, and then you can say thank you again. Okay, oh. mm -hmm. sweet. When she says sweet, sassy, glassy, you say Wait. dot com. Yeah, I, hey, it's her thing. Okay, go for it. Help me out. Help a girl out. <laughs>
Go ahead for Tammy. Sweet Sassy Glassy. Dot com. Sing it. No. <laughs> <laughs>All right, so Lauren, in the time since we did our first interview with you in Oregon over the summer, there's been quite a few things that's been going on in the Bigfoot world. For example, portals, gate guardians, Bigfoot captured, and of course, Bigfoot on the cover of a Newsweek special edition. So I wanted to uh, poke your brain a little bit and find out what are your thoughts are on all these recent Bigfoot happenings in the Bigfoot world. So let's start with portals. Nothing new in that realm. John Keel, you know, Eric Beck Jordan, there have been people talking about portals and interdimensional Bigfoot and 4D Bigfoot for, you know, since the 70s. It's just so boring that all of a sudden a new generation wakes up turns on their YouTube and, wow, they discovered portals, wow. It's baloney, it's all baloney. But it's, what I do with it is I respect people. If you wanna believe in that, if you wanna consider that as a possibility, fine. But Ivan T. Sanderson said to me, why do you explain one unknown with another unknown? And that's what they're doing. They're taking something that nobody knows really anything about. There's no evidence for it. And they're trying to say Bigfoot, which we don't know whether it exists or not, is coming from another dimension. What does that help any of us? Second thing, Bigfoot captured on the History Channel had real Bigfoot researchers like Dr. Bender Noggle, Dr. Meldrum, and that Rocky Mountain Sasquatch organization, Kelly Shaw, and mm -hmm. actors catching a Bigfoot and putting Bigfoot in a cage. Now, uh, would you ever be filmed intentionally with actors, with um, Harry and the Hendersons person in a costume being made out to be like it really happened? Would you ever be a part of that? Did they ever reach out and contact you for your input? What are your thoughts? Or is it, is it all just Bigfoot entertainment? Well, yes, it's Bigfoot entertainment. It's on the same level as the Megalodon and the mermaid shockumentaries, mockumentaries. I actually have a lot of sympathy for the researchers that were on that program because it's happened to me a few times where documentary filmmakers, reality TV people come my way and they say, Will you be on this show? We want your serious scientific view of these facts. I get on there and, you know, I get an honorarium or I get my travel or I get to go to some place like the, the roof of a, a building in Santa Monica that's kind of beautiful to be there for a couple, three days. Then I get home, I look at the thing that's on TV and it's a complete fiction in which they cut off quotes that they want to use from me without me knowing what they're doing. So I really empathize with Jeff Melder, who found himself in the middle of a program that he probably didn't really know about what was going on. So I've been on shows like Unsolved Mysteries where they've had actors recreating events in which I had no control of. So, you know, it's that kind of situation. I think all of us go into things if, if some would say this is going to be about capturing Bigfoot, you're suspicious, but that's not what they tell you. Right, but you know, recreating something with actors is they did that with In Search of. They do that with a lot of these crime TV shows. So I think that's a little acceptable considering they're going along with what you are telling them, what the narrative of the story is, instead of, ooh, let's have uh Lauren talk about what he would do if Bigfoot was to be captured, and then we'll have actors actually capture Bigfoot and make it like it's real and have a Justin Smale look-alike and have like a nerdy looking Todd Disatel uh, impersonator talk about how they're capturing Bigfoot and how they're going to get its DNA and make it scary. There's kind of a difference. So, you know, I mean, when they did the recreations with you with like Unsolved Mysteries. You have to be careful. That's okay, I mean right? 
The, the recreations in reality TV is sort of okay. You still have a lot of, you know, you're out of control. You have a lot of kind of permission that you give up by being on those programs. Permission for them to lie, for them to edit, for them to do all kinds of things with your footage. So you don't really know what you're getting into. A lot of people want to be on those programs because they need the publicity or they're uh, hoping they'll educate the public. It usually doesn't turn out that way. This one was very much for entertainment. You have to be careful. Right. I wouldn't be on it. Speaking of entertainment, Bigfoot, special edition of Newsweek. Rumor has it, Lauren, you helped them with this. Now, as I turn the pages, I don't see anything about Lauren Coleman in Maine. What happened? I don't know why. I was busy. I was doing a lot of important things like moving our museum, doing fundraising for the museum. And I helped them a little with contacts, with some... You know, I showed them different pictures that they could use because they approached me and it was going to be a serious scientific view of what we should do to look for Bigfoot in a scientific, serious way. So I helped them up to that limit. Uh, they didn't put me in there. That's fine. I'm not, my ego is not hurt by that. But what I am upset about is that it's really, it's People Magazine for Bigfoot. It's really pretty lame, most of it. Now, Dr. Dissetel from New York University, he's like their, you know, um, anthropologist, uh, said that, seriously, the world's top experts discuss there is not a single scientific data point in the whole issue. So this is just entertainment as well. I'd have to agree. He hit the nail on the head. Todd is right on. So he wasn't in this, you were in this, so, and I wasn't in this, so, yeah, this is, isn't, this isn't, um, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some people in there that have been studying Bigfoot for about two years, too. But we really? won't, yeah, we won't mention. And then, of course, Rick Dyer has, oh. like, a full page spread uh, in here. That, and that he didn't even know him. he was going to be in this told me a lot about the whole issue that Rick, what's his name? I don't agree with magazines that publicize book burners. Ooh. Okay, uh, we're going to take some questions from our viewers. Uh, let's see. Oh, we have a question now from Stephen Stroyford from Bigfoot Books. I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, Stephen wants to know, do you believe in everything that you write about? Is the Loch Ness Monster real? Or is this just part of your lifestyle? For in, for example, Lauren, is there a hierarchy? Like, yeah, you believe in Bigfoot more, but then the Loch Ness Monster, not so much. Well, I really like Stephen. I think he's a quite bright individual, but he obviously hasn't read my books in depth because one of the first things that I talk about is the use of the word believe. I don't believe in any of this. Belief is about the providence of religion. And those people that are true believers and debunkers are two of the problems in the field. We need to occupy the middle. The skeptically open-minded people, the open-mindedly skeptical people are the ones I tend to agree with. I look for evidence. I talk about it on an individual case-by-case -case basis. But I, of course, also have a history a history of evolution, of psychological maturity, of writing a book in 1975 called uh, you know, The Unidentified, a book in 1978 called Creatures of the Outer Edge, in which I looked at the whole field from a Jungian point of view. Are these projective, collective, unconscious, you know, trupa, tupas? Uh, so I don't consider those part of my personality anymore. When the book was republished, uh, Jerry Clark and I did a whole new introduction explaining we were young. We were fooling with different thoughts. It's different than what we think today. So, of course, there's a hierarchy. There are some cryptids that are more possible than others. I am very sincere about everything I write because what I'm looking for are new species. 
not the latest folkloric animal that can be put into a toy or made into a action figure. I'm serious about this. I think there are new animals out there. I think there's a possibility of Bigfoot. I've always written that about Loch Ness Monster. It's only a 50-50 chance because after all, it's in the water. You don't have real good physical evidence. So chupacabras, people are totally crazy about chupacabras. And yet we know that all of the four-legged ones are 100% canids with mange. So, you know, I could just go through all of them and tell you my different thoughts, but I don't want to bore people that really aren't interested in different cryptids. Okay, so, for example, Loch Ness Monster, um, Aliens, Bigfoot. Yeah, Bigfoot's more deal, possible than a Loch Ness Monster. I don't deal with aliens. A lot of people that come into the museum here, they say, well, where are the aliens? Where are the ghost corner? You know, we don't do that stuff. We talk about cryptozoology, the study of hidden or unknown animals. Bigfoot is part of that. Uh, but aliens, you know, kind of different reptilians, all kinds of strange conspiracy stuff is really outside what I want to be interested in, what I want to talk about, and what I go out searching in the field for. Right now, right behind you, you have a friend of the forest. You have the forest, you have a forest friend there standing right behind you. Can you tell us about him and what's been going on with your museum? I guess you're moving. Well, behind me is the Crookston Bigfoot. This was something that was created by a taxidermist in 1991 in Wisconsin. And then the town of Crookston, Minnesota decided they wanted to be the capital of the Bigfoot world. They had one case in 1981. So they bought this creature here for $10,000, took it over there. Nobody would put it in a museum or anything. So it ended up in the front of a roast beef restaurant. Of course it did, roast beef restaurant. So. Finally, in 2003, I got my hands on it, brought it here, opened the museum, and it's eight feet tall, 500 pounds, and it's become our iconic symbol of the museum. Everybody comes in, they get their picture taken in front of it, then they post it on Facebook or put it in their Christmas cards, whatever. Uh, yes, we are going to move. Uh, we are running out of our lease here. We've been kind of unhappy with this space because there's no parking that's really good. And there's been a development right on the edge of town called Thompson's Point that everybody in Portland's been waiting for for 10 years to really take off. It's finally taking off next year. We're having a museum built in that, uh, in the building, one of the building that's an old railroad locomotive repair depot. And right down the middle of it, we're having our museum with uh, this museum here that I'm in is only one floor. We're gonna have a museum that has a first floor, a second floor. Second floor, it's not gonna have a roof, so people are gonna be able to look over, look at the cryptids. Right down below us is a coffee shop and a bakery. And then on one side of that bakery is a distillery. On the other side of us is going to be a brewery. Uh, and 50 parking spaces out front of the 750 parking spaces at Thompson's Point is going to be designated for the museum. So we're gonna have plenty of parking, we're gonna have new exhibits, we're gonna have a whole recurated museum. And of course this costs money, so we're doing a capital campaign. And uh, most people can find me on Twitter and on Facebook and they can you know, help us out. But that's exciting because we're gonna actually be overlapping in both places between April and August. And we're gonna be out there, we got a 10 year lease and we're gonna be there forever. Wow, you got a lot going on, Lauren. Are you writing a book right now? I'm writing a couple books. I'm doing a conference in Florida in January. Um, you know, and so it's it's just a lot's going on. I feel under a lot of stress. You know, send money. It alleviates my stress. My next book is going to be The Transformation of Cryptozoology. In fact, I'm actually looking at a program that might interest you. I think it was called uh, The Bigfoot Bounty. And I really examine that and, and really talk about how, even though it was somewhat criticized by some individuals, I thought it was a very groundbreaking uh, look at Bigfooters and people that are outside the Bigfoot field trying to be in the Bigfoot field. I also really very much applauded it for 
looking at a diversity in people. And that was quite well done. And of course, I love that it ended up at the Frank, at a Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, designed location for its finale. So it had all the best things for me. Well, I, I'm partial <laughs> toward uh, Bigfoot Bounty, so yay. <laughs> Make sure I get to write the forward in this. Well. <laughs> Because you know I'm, because I, I, I'm the star of Bigfoot Bounty. Of <laughs> so everybody, uh, I want you to check out uh, Lauren Coleman's recent book, Bigfoot: The Apes Among Us. You can find it on Amazon.com. And he also wrote Cryptozoology from A to Z. Thank you. If anybody comes to the museum, they've already purchased those books. I always autograph them for people. And um, here's the link to his uh, crypto museum is down below, so be able to check that out. And uh, Lauren's Twitter account. He's easily accessible. If you have any questions for Lauren about Bigfoot and cryptids, he's right there for you. He's your go-to man. Okay, so we, before we end this, uh, Lauren recently got his very own first tattoo. And it's from those cave drawings uh, Kathy Strain wrote about. Tell us about that tattoo. Well, that tattoo, I, I decided, you know, even though I was a tattoo virgin, I'd go ahead and go full, full boat and do it in a place in which I'd actually wear short sleeve shirts and be proud of it. It's a petroglyph of a tribe in Northern California, a thousand year old petroglyph, and it's called Hairy Man. So that made sense since Bigfoot, Hairy Man, all of that is very important to me. Very happy with it. So your new tattoo is the Hairy Man on a Hairy Man. Hmm. Yeah, I guess so. I made the mistake of looking on the internet recently and typed in Harry Man, and I could not believe the pictures that came up. My! You don't want to go there. Oh, I do. <laughs> I do like them big and hairy. Well, uh, thank you, Lauren, for um, adding to, your, to our interview from our original interview at Beachfoot. Uh, you know, every 10 minutes there's something new happening in the world of Bigfoot, and I'm glad we were able to touch base on portals and the Bigfoot Newsweek and Bigfoot Captured. So, till next till time. Till next time. Thank you. Have a good holiday. Okay, now you can say what you're thinking. What? Say your thank you part again. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me out in the woods with you. It's been quite an experience. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Came out pretty cool. Yeah, we're not interested in believing in this thing. Uh, we'd like to see it ourselves. Uh, but we do give some credence to the claims of people who see them. So what we're doing is we're investigating the issue uh, on the ground in the area where they're most uh, noted for being uh, historically. Uh, the Bluff Creek watershed is world famous, of course. Uh, so we come up here and we test the hypothesis, you know, with our cameras and just by being here and looking around. Hey, my little Squatch Monsters, it's time to shake up the Bigfoot community. This is Off the Richter. I hate to bring it up, but there does seem to be a connection to UFO. Bigfoot's invisible. Yet they're invisible. Did he just say Bigfoot's invisible? Yet they're invisible. No one's going to take you seriously. We know for a fact that squirrels can't cloak. Oh god, here we go. Make sure your chairs are raised and tray tables locked in the upright position. If Roger Patterson were alive, he would be kicking your ass. Put down the bong and prove me wrong. God, why am I always having to tell this to you Bigfooters? You want your Bigfoot video to be seen? Now's your chance. How can you look for Bigfoot with all this marijuana smoke? Hey, I'm Richter. I'm Bigfoot OG.